we'll have in the order will be first uh, Jim Hansen, then Tim Palmer, and then Jerry Melillo. Uh, Jim Hansen is has his office uh, down the street, two blocks above Tom's restaurant, made famous by Seinfeld. But even more famous is what goes on upstairs in NASA's uh, sort of theoretical division that um, specializes in climate modeling. Uh, but Jim's personal interest, back from the time he was a student in Iowa, graduate student, has been in particulate matter radiation balance in the Earth's atmosphere. So his remarks uh, will be concerned with one of the complications that I mentioned in my talk, and that is uh, what is the role of particulates in the present climate and how will their contribution evolve with time. So uh, it's all yours, Jim. Thanks, Wally. The problems uh, of climate change and air pollution should be considered together. Um, I will outline some of the important aspects of an integrated view of these problems, uh, which we can then discuss later. Is this, should I speak to this or? Okay, is it better to speak into this one? Okay. Okay, as I was saying, I, I will outline some of the aspects of an integrated view of the air pollution and, and climate change problems. The uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, which all countries, including the United States, have agreed upon, states that we must find a way to stabilize atmospheric composition at a level avoiding dangerous anthropogenic interference with climate. But uh, what level of global change constitutes dangerous anthropogenic interference? The history of the Earth shows us that global warming of more than about one degree Celsius above today's temperature leads to sea level rise of up to several meters, which would uh, destroy much of Bangladesh and the Nile Delta, uh, many island nations and uh, most of Florida, for example. And uh, unlike the building of ice sheets, which requires millennia, the collapse of large portions of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets is a wet process that can occur in a century or two. There are many reasons uh, to keep global warming from exceeding about one degree Celsius, I believe, including the preservation of the Arctic environment. Uh, because of the strong albedo feedback of sea ice, the Arctic will become, uh, I meant to switch my slides, uh, the Arctic will become mostly a large lake if we get uh, warming of much more than one degree Celsius with uh, quagmires along the shorelines. Uh, regional climate changes are, are more difficult to uh, predict in detail, but uh, it's pretty clear that warming of a few degrees Celsius would really leave us with a very different planet. So what are the forcing agents that are driving the world toward a warmer climate? Carbon dioxide is the single largest forcing. It's now about 1.4 watts per meter squared. However, uh, air pollutants that cause hundreds of thousands of premature deaths per year and cost many billions of dollars in both human and agricultural losses cause a similar climate forcing to that by carbon dioxide. And I refer specifically to tropospheric ozone, its precursors, especially methane, and uh, soot, or black carbon aerosols. CO2 is the largest forcing, but the others are significant. Now, there is a feasible scenario that would keep 
that would avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference or avoid warming of more than one degree Celsius and provide a environment where wildlife could continue to exist other than uh, in places like the Central Park Zoo. Um, and that scenario requires an equal emphasis on flattening out CO2 emissions this half century so that the added CO2 forcing is only about one watt per meter squared and CO2 emissions that decline in the second half of the century so that the total CO2 forcing is about one and a half watts per meter squared. The other half of this alternative uh, scenario is to halt the growth of conventional air pollutants. Now, flattening out of CO2 emissions is practical, and it does not require uh, Manhattan projects. In fact, uh, Manhattan projects are diversion and an excuse not to do things that should be done. The growth rate of CO2 emissions declined from 4 to 5 percent per year to 1.4 percent in the early 1970s as a result of energy efficiencies and the decoupling of uh, CO2 emissions from economic growth. This growth rate could be pushed down further to zero percent by the co constant fossil fuel use, by the combination of greater efficiencies in automobiles and buildings, for example, and by end the use of renewable energies, and uh, CO2 sequestration, and uh, next generation nuclear power. The the um, most effective way to achieve that would be via energy costing with uh, no net increases in taxes, I believe. Um, the, um, if the non-CO2 forcings increase one half watt per meter square this century, as they do in the IPCC scenarios, then CO2 would need to be capped at 440 parts per million to avoid global warming of one degree. That, I think, is not practical, given the energy infrastructure that's now in place. However, if the non-CO2 forcings are reduced by half a watt per meter squared, which is feasible with a concerted effort, then the CO2 cap required to avoid one degree warming with canonical climate sensitivity of three degrees for doubled CO2 becomes 520 parts per million, which is much more feasible. So the conclusion is that the non-CO2 forcings are also important. Here are global climate simulations with a model having the canonical sensitivity of about three degrees for doubled CO2. And with this alternative scenario of climate forcings, with an increase of one and a half watts in 100 years, the global warming remains less than one degree Celsius. Now finally, uh, I want to note a workshop that was held one month ago at the East-West Center in Hawaii on air pollution as a climate forcing. The workshop report is in preparation now, but I can, I can state a few conclusions with some confidence. One, there is a great opportunity to reduce climate forcings and improve public health and agricultural productivity via feasible reductions in fugitive methane and other ozone precursors and obtain in the process a small negative forcing by reduction of um, methane and ozone in the atmosphere. Two, there are large potential benefits for both air quality uh, and reducing CO2 emissions from an increased emphasis on energy efficiency. 
And third, in order to minimize the global warming from the expected reduction in sulfate aerosols, we need to target uh, reductions of uh, black carbon or soot aerosols. So the bottom line is that there, there are benefits to both developed and developing countries in reducing air pollution and avoiding large climate change. And there is much opportunity for technological cooperation for the benefit of all. This do, does not need to be a contentious matter, I think, between developed and developing countries. Uh, we're all in it together, and it's in our mutual interest to address uh, both the air pollution and the climate change and, uh, and to have technical cooperation in doing that. Thanks.